Do you love going to Broadway shows, but can't go now because Broadway's closed? Join tour guide Tim and Velasco too as they bring Broadway history to you. Grab your Broadway passport for what's in store on your virtual Broadway tour. Things were looking bleak for Broadway in the late 1960s. Crime rates were on the rise and Times Square had become a dangerous place to visit. Fewer tourists visiting quickly translated into empty seats. Unless drastic measures were taken, one of the city's most unique and thriving industries was in danger of extinction. Enter John V. Lindsay. Elected mayor of New York City in 1965, Lindsay was faced with a host of problems plaguing the beloved city he had grown up in. Labor and transit strikes, a deadly blizzard, and race riots. Using Times Square as his linchpin, Lindsay believed that the cleanup of the theater district would lead to more business and commerce, which would benefit New York City as a whole. After decades without a new Broadway theater built, Lindsay hoped that the construction of new theaters would be the perfect antidote for the city's woes. He amended zoning laws in Midtown Manhattan to allow developers 20% more space than usually permitted if they included a theater in their design. Thankfully, this would add three new theaters to the Broadway roster. The Circle in the Square, the Eurus, now the Gershwin, and this week's theater, the Minskoff. As luck would have it, during Lindsay's first month as mayor in January 1966, the Minskoff family was beginning plans for a new skyscraper. They had recently purchased the historic Hotel Astor with the intention of demolishing it. Built in 1904 on land owned by the legendary Astor family, the 11-story hotel occupied the entire block between 44th and 45th streets in Times Square. Boasting over 1,000 rooms, grand ballrooms, extravagant restaurants, and a rooftop garden theater where Frank Sinatra would make some of his first New York City appearances, the Hotel Astor was one of the defining structures of Old Times Square, but was without landmark status. In 1967, Sam Minskoff and Sons began demolition, and the Hotel Astor was no more. As part of their skyscraper, a fresh, modern theater design was employed in stark contrast to the historic theaters in the block, beginning with the entrance. Escalators carried theater goers from the sidewalk up 35 feet to the lobby. Once inside, the lobby and theater interior were designed free of any columns for a sleek, streamlined look providing great sight lines from every seat, perfect for musicals and big spectacles. A new era of theater building had begun. While the Minskoff was bold and modern on the exterior, its opening production was anything but. On March 13, 1973, the first official production of the Minskoff Theatre opened, a revival of the 1919 musical Irene. Critics had mixed reactions to the musical. Clyde Barnes of the New York Times called it the best 1919 musical in town, but audiences didn't care. They came out in droves to see Debbie Reynolds in the title role. After years on the silver screen, Reynolds made her long-awaited Broadway debut in the musical, with her 16-year-old daughter Carrie Fisher making her debut as well. They were joined by George S. Irving, who won a Tony Award for his performance as Madame Lucy. Over the next few decades, the Minskoff hosted a slew of successful concerts interspersed with a line of flops. But to me, the most interesting flop was the first flop in the theater's history, Rockabye Hamlet, a rock version of Shakespeare's Hamlet that featured a song called He Got It in the Ear and a cringeworthy moment where the character of Ophelia, played by D Beverly D'Angelo, commits suicide on stage by strangling herself with her microphone cord. It ran for all of three performances. Thankfully, things would eventually turn around at the Minskoff. Flops aside, the Minskoff would eventually present a few successful musicals, including the original Sunset Boulevard starring Glenn Close and a revival of Fiddler on the Roof starring Alfred Molina. 
To make way for Mary Poppins at the New Amsterdam Theater, The Lion King moved from the New Amsterdam to the Minskoff 10 years into its run, where it has continued to play to nearly sold out audiences for over a decade. It is one of only three shows in history to earn a billion dollars in gross ticket sales just from its Broadway run. The Phantom of the Opera and Wicked are the other two, and holds the record as the highest grossing entertainment property in the world. As of this year, on-stage productions of The Lion King have grossed over $8 billion. And one woman has been there to see it all. Ensemble member Linda Delmini has been with the production for all 22 years so far. Times Square was resuscitated one theater at a time, just as Mayor Lindsay envisioned in the 1970s. And now, with a global pandemic having shut down the entire theater district, we'll look again to our glorious theaters to get New York City back on track once restrictions are lifted. Hello! Saturday, again, can you believe it? I think I say this every Saturday, and every Saturday it's a genuine surprise that we are at another Saturday. I feel like I just sat in front of this wall, I just saw you, but I guess that was seven days ago. So here we are. Welcome to uh, the tail end of our entire journey together, week 39 of this, which is insane. Saturday noon on Broadway, every Saturday as part of our virtual Broadway tour series, we're coming to you live with someone who's worked at the theater we're featuring that week. And this week we are joined by the incredible, the funny, the very talented uh, Tom Warren from The Lion King and other things, but specifically The Lion King at the Minskoff. For those that aren't familiar with me or Broadway Up Close, my name is Tim Dolan. I'm an actor and the owner of Broadway Up Close in New York City. For the last 11 years, our tours uh, of the theater district bring you up close to the fun facts, the history, the ghost stories, all the things you didn't know you didn't know that you really want to know about our 41 Broadway theaters. My entire team uh, that I call my green team, actors and stage managers, are your windows and your eyes to the world of our insane theatrical lives. Last year, uh, well now, gosh, a year and a half ago, in addition to all of that, I opened a gift shop in the middle of Times Square with a six foot tall Broadway sign of big marquee letters and 150 light bulbs. All of that is closed because of this little thing I'm sure you've heard of called the Broadway we shut down global pandemic that we're doing still, that we're still a year later doing, which is insane. Um, uh, in addition to the five exterior tours, we also have our interior tour of the Hudson Theater, which is Broadway's oldest. It's been there 118 years. So information on all of that, you should head to our website, www.broadwayupclose.com. You shouldn't do it now. You should wait till we're done talking to Tom, and then you should go give me all of your money. Sounds like a great idea. Uh, this is, I, I can't believe it. Uh, yesterday was the one year mark. Uh, of course, uh, my entire life is padded with theatrical people in my life. So my entire feed all day and all week has really been this looming one year shutdown. When I started this series, it's 41 weeks. It's one theater a week. I said, okay, we've, uh, I waited till 10 weeks in and then we started it. And so I said, by the time we're hit a year, our theaters will be reopening. And while that clearly is not happening, there, there has been some hope on the horizon. There are starting, you know, they're starting to be a little more concrete thoughts about September, maybe being go time. Certainly the weather has changed in New York City so that, you know, hope is high anytime the sun comes out after our seasonal winter depression. So, um, so here we are. In the meantime, we're finishing up this series, 41 theaters, 41 weeks. I can't believe we're here. Week 39, the Minskoff Theater. And I have to say, I didn't plan this, but happy birthday, Minskoff Theater. On March 13th, 1973, the Minskoff opened, which is today, uh, and it is all the years later. I don't know, do the math. It's um, maybe 40 something years old, 40 nine years old, maybe? I don't know. Maths. This is why I sing and dance. Um, I hope you enjoyed all of our history, our fun facts this week. How is today going to work? For today's series, we'll learn all about Tom's theatrical journey, his time working on The Lion King uh, at the Minskoff. If you have any questions for him or me along the way, drop them in the comments. And for those that are watching us live, comment with where you're watching us from, which you're all, all doing wonderfully. Uh, I love you all. Thank you for that. Uh, are you ready? Without further ado, join me in welcoming Broadway's Tom Christopher Warren. Ta da! <laughs> Hi, friend. Hi. If only, if only every audition you ever had in your life you got announced like that. I that think would it, would be, <laughs> it would be a better place. Hi. Happy Saturday. I'm, how are you? I'm well. I'm well. Can we talk about how obsessed I am with your theme song? Oh, sure. Come on. Talk? The um yeah we uh, when we first started I said I guess we have to have like a jingle uh, and so my social media manager Erica Lustig who's also an incredible performer. She sat down and I said, "This I want it to be like this, Broadway's closed. I don't know, we have this Broadway passport, do that. And she was like, okay. And 15 minutes later, she was like, how about this? Do bop, 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 bop. And I 
I said, sure. My graphic designer is incredible. He designed it. Uh, and um, yeah, what is our lives? It, it's surrounding yourselves and patting yourself with theatrical people um, makes things like that happen very quickly, as I'm sure you know. Yeah. yeah. You have an idea. And then suddenly yeah. a day later, you're like, and it's done. It's Here, it totally <laughs> really. Here we are. Um, for those who don't know you and your life and aren't lucky to know and love you, will you tell us, um, before we get to Lion King, we your fanciness and a very professorial and all of this, um, will you tell us where you grew up, will you tell us um, maybe when you first got exposed to theater that was on your radar, when that transitioned into maybe this is something I can do professionally and essentially get us to Tom Christopher Warren setting down his suitcases a la Thurley Modern Millie in New York City for the first time. Okay, fun fact, I've never lived in New York City. Uh, I, isn't that crazy? Oh gosh, yeah, right, you were in New Jersey. Yeah. So I grew up in New Jersey. Oh. So I was coming into the city, I was one of those precocious theater kids, so I had a manager at you know 15. So I was seeing theater at you know, 9, 10. My mother was um, really awesome, very sort of anti-mame-like. And so she uh, was always bringing me in and, and taking me to, to see theater and to see um, opera, which I, I didn't really care for. I, you know, I, I knew early on that, okay, the dance concerts weren't really speaking to me. The opera wasn't really speaking to me. You know, she paid a million dollars for Madame Butterfly tickets and I slept through the whole thing. Right. Theater, you know, yeah. uh, Annie in 1977, that was my jam. And- um, yeah, so You saw it at the Elvin? I did, I saw it with Sarah Jessica, actually. You did? I did, I did. Oh, and, gosh. I, and then, oh. And, oh, and I staged oh. it. I staged doored it and they were the Annie's at the time were signing their name with two circles and curly hair, like the cartoon. Yeah. Annie. Um, and I, I can't find because I've moved 1700 times, I can't find it. But I did have it when I was working with SJP and was able to bring it in and be like, hey, I got your autograph. I mean, Come I was, on. And yeah. so we'll, we're going to get there eventually. But also, we'll tell you right now, Tom was in Once Upon a Mattress with um, SJP, as we're calling her now. Yeah. Um, that is, oh, my life, my life. I had no idea. Um, okay, so yeah. opera is, is an expensive nap. Theater is your jam. This yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I was, you know, I was going into the city ready regularly. So the idea, and I was too, by the time I was old enough to, you know, be going in regularly for auditions and stuff uh, and had a car, I, I've always been too stubborn to let go of my car. So the idea of leaving New Jersey to, to live where I didn't need a car felt wrong to me. <laughs> um, so I always commuted and the commute length changed over, you know, 40 years of living there. Right. Um, for a time, I was right on the other side of the Hudson, you know, Weehawken, Jersey City, West New York, all those little theaters. Yeah. Um, and then moved to Maplewood, you know, where the, the Broadway Express was, where so many people moved to raise families and have, you know, land. Land. Grass. Like remember grass? grass? <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't remember it, but I hear that it's still a thing that people have. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, New York has always been sort of the lens through which I've looked. Um, wow. And really, this is the long. This is the longest I've been uh, without setting foot in New York City this year. Wow. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's got to feel. Yeah, it's got to feel so strange. Okay. Did you? So you see all these shows when you're young. You had a manager at 15. Was it always like the moment you saw shows and you're so close and you see shows with kids in them professionally that you're like, maybe I'm going to do that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know if you know this, but um, my my friends who've been with me for many years do know that I was uh, a, a, a member of uh, Mickey Rooney's Talent Town. I don't know if you've ever heard of Mickey Rooney's Talent you Town. Were, I've heard of it, sure. Oh, you should look it up. It, it really and truly was amazing. But it was a school that had two locations, one in New Jersey, one in California. And Mickey opened it up with some, some pals who ran it. Yeah. Uh, and it was you know, your sort of after school singing, dancing, acting lessons, um, scene study, uh, commercial stuff. And all of the teachers were working professionals. And a lot of the kids funneled through, weirdly enough, all the companies of Annie. So I got my manager because she managed all the little girls in the tours and the Broadway production, wow. the, the long initial Broadway run of Annie. Yeah. So, um, so I had a frame of reference through like kids that I knew you know, one of the kids booked Evita right before it closed. One of the kids, yeah. So like they were child workers, but also like not Hollywood. You know what I mean? Not not yeah. movie stars. They were theater. Yeah, theater kids are uh, those kids. 
Yeah, with the recent uh, upcrop of like the Matildas and the Billy Elliots, and of course, you know, the young Nalas and Simbas always. Um, yeah, I used to teach for Rosie O'Donnell and they their musical theater program is is yeah. professional performing arts school. And you'd meet these kids and they're like, off to work. And they go to Matilda and they're like, I'm in, you know, Grinch. And you're like, what a funny, they're all just, Working, but working. they're all 12. <laughs> yeah, and that wasn't a thing back then. I mean, Annie really was a standalone. This is before Little Mermaid. This is before Beauty and the Beast, before Broadway was producing for families. Right. Annie was kind of a standalone, um, you know, in the middle of the crap hole that was Times Square. Right. And uh, so, yeah, I felt very... I felt very grown up. Wow. Uh, and we did, we performed with Mickey. We made uh, a 45 album with Mickey, which was very fun. I, I was probably 13, 14 at the time, maybe 15. Gosh. Yeah. This is wild. So then, okay. So, <clears throat> so your, your thoroughly modern Millie moment happens like every Saturday as you're going to see shows and you're like, I'm yeah. here to stay, but across that river. So then where do you go to school? Do you, after high school, do you go to college for, for a minute, I, I I went to Rutgers. I was a voice major. Loved Rutgers. Didn't love being a voice major. Um, okay. you know, they won't let you sing Broadway. Right. I was going to say because it's opera and that's an expensive nap. We've yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but of course, is impeccable training. But what do I know it? Sure. I mean, so I didn't. I interned at George Street Playhouse, which is a regional theater in New Jersey. Yeah. Um, and I spent a year interning with them in their press and marketing department. And I wound up really kind of working in all of the departments other than development. So to this day, I still know nothing about grant writing or anything like that. But <laughs> sure. I wrote a lot of commercial copy. I wrote notes for directors. I schlepped actors to and from the airport. I um, at one point we were doing uh, a play called The Eighties, a two hander with I don't know if you know who uh, Audra Lindley was, uh -uh. Uh, Mrs. Roper from Three's Company. Oh gosh, yes. And her ex husband James Whitmore, who was a movie star um, for years, Shawshank Redemption. A lot of folks know him. So they were long divorced, but still sort of best friends and doing these two-hander plays together. And so I was there, like run notes with them, you know, run lines with them, take them to and from the grocery store. I was there, their gal Friday. Wow. And it, they were amazing. I just, everything I learned in that year was kind of formative for me. Yeah. And this year, like what, 19, 20 years old? 19. Yeah. This was an 88. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. And so then, so then uh, through all of this with your manager at 15, you're auditioning your, are you doing shows other than mm -hmm. Mickey Rooney, just like hanging out, putting on shows? I was doing tons of community theater. New Jersey is really remarkable in having, you know, what, I grew up in Edison, which is uh -huh. close to Rutgers, if you know New Brunswick. Um, and I probably had 30 community theaters within a half hour of my house. Uh -huh. So it, it was this really remarkable sort of fertile um, theater landscape there. Yeah. Uh, and I got my equity card when I was really young. I was 17. I was a senior in high school and I didn't use it much until I was 21, 22, but I had that lens. Um, and then through my manager, I did, uh, I did a movie when I was 21. I turned 21 on set of Mannequin 2 and I, I worked the whole shoot as a stand-in for, for our lead. Um, and then played a tiny role at the end, but I, I got to be present for the whole thing. Sort sure. of it all unfold and it was terrible, it's a terrible, terrible. As good as Mannequin is, Mannequin 2 is equally dreadful. <laughs> um, and, but it was a fascinating way to sort of get a glimpse into film. And sure. it was certainly the most money I had made as a 20 year old. Um, yeah, and by then I was old mm -hmm. enough, I had sort of grown into myself a little more and then I worked um, consistently union from there. Wow. So, yeah. What do you think was the first moment where in musical theater where you want to live. Where's, what's the first moment that you feel, oh, I'm not crazy for pursuing this. Someone is paying me to, and it, this could, I could have a life doing this lucratively. Uh, probably um, Babes in Arms was the first at the Guthrie that was in 90. I actually had to write these things down. I had to go through my old contracts because I, I remember my career in vague terms, but the yeah. names are a complete question mark. So uh, yeah, Babes in Arms was 90. I'm in love with it. 95, 96. <laughs> I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed that your resume, I, like. Oh, I literally yeah. have to go through my contracts. I, Cause I just don't know. So yeah, I got, so Babes was wild. It was, um, a show, you know, a score that everybody knew a song from, but it was a rewritten book. 
um, by Ken Lezebnik, who was famous at the time for writing, um, oh, what's, what was that Heaven TV show with Michael Landon? Um, Gosh, not Knott's Landing, I don't know. No, no, I'm, it's slipping my mind right now, but, um, and it was like a, a kind of all-star cast of unknowns. Okay. Um, you know, it was like Aaron Dilley, Christian Chenoweth, Kevin Cahoon, Billy Ludwig, like this remarkable group of humans, but we were all children. Sure. Children. I'm actually one of the older ones. I think I was 26 at the time. Um, but, you know, and so that was, and there were six callbacks and it was an endless audition process, like endless, but really joyful, like really, really fun. Liza Gennaro choreographed, Garland Wright directed, and Liza made that whole highway to heaven. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. say, you'll see it. Yeah. This is, uh, they all did it. <laughs> Apparently everyone knew it. Thank you all for being my memory. Um, yeah, so once, Crazy. once we got Babes, that kind of, you know, the, the idea that I was doing a show at the Guthrie, yeah. this renowned theater, right? That I was working with these people who were remarkable, um, that I was working on that skit, like the money that was put into that show, it looked so beautiful. Uh, you know, one song had, it was 14 minutes long and had like seven costume changes in the song. Oh, so my. that was the moment where I was like, oh, this is lucrative. Um, and was the intention to bring it in, why did they, I mean, the Guthrie is the Guthrie, right? But yeah. it seems like they're spending so much money that maybe this feels like a slight out of town. Maybe we'll try to revive this or no? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was the idea. It, it was at the time the most money the Guthrie had ever spent on a show and also the most money they'd ever lost on a show. Right. So uh, it, it, I re really, truly, honestly remember it being remarkable, like really wonderful, even removed now for whatever, 25 years. I think it was great. Yeah. But clearly enough was wrong with it that no one wanted to bring it in. Yeah. Um, and the the Rogers and Hammerstein estate didn't care for the new book. So that well, we then, knew then you're dead in the water. Yeah. yeah. We knew very quickly that we those plans were not coming to fruition. But like friendships at that point were forged that would last lifetime. Right. And we were all kids and you know, we've been friends ever since. Crazy. So then Broadway debut, how much longer, when does that, okay, you're 26 when you do Babes in Arms, where does Once Upon a Mattress's Broadway debut, right? <laughs> yeah, the following year. Like, like literally looking at my list. Mm -hmm. I mean. <laughs> Never looked better. You still got it. You look I, great. Like, I can't remember anything, but you look great. Nothing. I can remember nothing. And I think uh, part of that is teaching. I think part of that is, you know, taking on the, the yes. the weight of young people has diminished my mental capacity yes by a significant amount. Uh, I taught enough kindergarten tap classes to feel that yes I know yes so okay so you uh so when uh once upon a mattress was how old what was I 27 okay so um, and working you know by then I I'd done um I I'd worked at the Guthrie so I felt you know I felt um had I done Paper Mill yet? I think I'd done a show at Paper Mill. So like I had enough sort of understanding of the regional landscape that I was like, you know what? I think I'm ready to do this. If I get cast, I'm going to feel, you know, like I'm a part of something that I'm ready to be a part of. But right. Mattress was also, it was my debut, but I was also swinging for the first time. And I had understudied, but not 11 tracks. So, right. you know, three of which were principal. So, and, I, and I'm not a dancer first. So the idea of swinging, you know, my mind doesn't work quite that mathematically yeah. in the way that it has to if you're a swing. So I learned that on my feet. Um, and it was, I had the best time ever with that show. Like, what a crazy, I mean, I I did it in high school, of course. I did the, uh, this transport group revival. Yeah. But I, my whole life, the recording I always listened to was your, your cast, your recording. And all the, you know, the, um, all the songs that were added and the different orchestrations and the, just everything to me, that was the definitive, um, the definitive thing. I really love now. I, I joined that show late. Uh, they had, they had just completed the cast album. So okay. they had opened, gotten reviewed, not well, right. put out the cast album. And then they hired two new swings, uh, a male and a female swing. And so we started work in January during the slump and ticket sales weren't great. So from the time I'd gotten the call from my agent that I booked to the time that I got the call from production with an actual offer was like two weeks. And I spent that whole two weeks just thinking, you know, this isn't going to happen. They're going to close. They hate me. I think I probably called Cindy Rush uh, at 
at Binder a hundred times in two weeks. Hi, I'm just just checking in. Just <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, it still, is it still happening? Are we still doing this? This is the worst, just wow. the worst thing you could do. Um, but yeah, we started it, and we got the the further the show got from the reviews from the creative team, uh, you know, and and they sort of found an ownership of it. And yeah. by the ironically, by the time we closed. It was a really great production. Oh, I think gosh. it hadn't found its legs early in the run yeah. for a, a bunch of reasons. But by the time we closed, it was kind of delightful and so, so charming. I, I actually like the new book. Yeah. Um, I find it a little leaner and yeah. I love the orchestrations. Yeah. Yeah, yes to all of that. Um, Carrie Mitchell, who we both love, is coming in with a hard-hitting question. How is Jane Krakowski? <laughs> so, so awesome. She was my date the first time I saw Broadway Bears. Uh, it was at Webster Hall that year, and Jane was my date. And just she came out to L.A. to see a bunch of us in Harmony. Uh, Jane, the mattress thing, you know, we closed, and um, I think Binder felt really guilty that we were closing so early. So he really funneled a lot of us into auditions for Harmony. Okay. Uh, and many of us, I think there were seven or eight of us who from the, the mattress cast that booked it. Wow. Um, so Jane came out to see a bunch of us in LA and she's the greatest. Wow. I mean, it's funny and quirky as she is in everything she does. She is that in life. Really? Plus kind. So I yeah. love that. Yeah. Yeah, she seems just like someone you'd want to like have all the drinks with and oh. just hang out. And it seems like she comes in with these weird talents that just out of nowhere. She just seems like she's one of these people where you're like, of course you know how to do that. Of course you can do that because you can do everything. Well, she was a theater kid too. Her mom for many years ran a, a women's theater company in North Jersey. Uh, oh, so she grew up in the theater and you know, she comes by it very honestly. It's in her blood. Um, okay, so then Harmony happens and Harmony they worked on for like 47 years, I think. Actually. 48, I think yeah, it's still. Just under 48, great. <laughs> and and was it, uh, you know, what was it like to be in that? And, and I only knew you were in this just because uh, of Rebecca's Rebecca Luker's passing recently, someone posted a thing, and I your name popped up, and I said, "Tom, I had no idea you were in this." Um, and so, it, what was this process like? What was it like to work with Rebecca? Uh, tell me everything. I mean, Harmony to date is the you would think that Lion King, fifteen years on the show, would be the sort of most formative moment in my sort of performing life, but it was really Harmony um, just through the entire development of that piece, creating a. a role in a show. I'd never done that really. Babes in Arms was a new book. So it, it that was kind of creating a role, but this was a much larger component to the play. Yeah. Um, you know, working with Rebecca and Danny and Janet Metz and Patrick Wilson and just this remarkable Jason Opsall, who I still miss. Um, it really, it, that production was wild. So many of us had been in Mattress. So we had just closed a Broadway show. Um, and there was this sort of sadness of that, right? Yeah. Um, and then we were doing this new thing written by Barry Manilow, who everybody knows as a pop writer and nobody really knows him as a, a writer of narrative music. Right. Um, and I didn't grow up listening to Barry. My, my mom listened to Barry. So I, I, he was peripheral in my sort of frame of reference. And I met him, you know, as a, I know Barry as a writer not necessarily as a mega star performer. You're not oh, a fan of is what you're saying. Yeah. I am now. Oh, 100%. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. Okay, I'm not initially a fan of No, I have now seen him in concert, I don't know, six, seven times. Because I, I, honest to God, can't get enough of his showmanship. He's just sure. remarkable. But Harmony, that experience was Barry the writer. Barry, the, like ego completely removed um, what will serve this piece best. If it's cutting this song, if it's adding this song, if it's doing, you know, he's, he's there. He and Bruce Sussman, who wrote the book and the right. lyrics, they were there entirely to serve this remarkable piece of theater, which is an incredible story. Uh, it's a true story about the comedian harmonists. Um, and in Weimar, Germany, two were Jewish uh, and there were two interfaith marriages in there. And why is it that no, they were huge. They were bigger than the Beatles, right? right? And why is it that no one knows who they are today? What what's responsible for that? And that's an that's theater. That's that's an interesting story. Uh, but the book and the music, they're just gorgeous. They're important. They're they're smart, but they're also 
beautiful, like and funny, then, wildly funny. So then the question becomes, why didn't it ever come in? I mean, why didn't I mean, it ever do well? I think there are many reasons to that. Um, I think, I, I think there are many reasons. Okay. Um, I, it's a tricky sell. Uh, cabaret was running sure. uh, during much of that, and I think that cabaret served the function of the, the Jewish centric Holocaust peripheral musical on Broadway. We weren't we're doing a lot of that kind of edgy stuff at the time. It was really kind of out of the box of what was, you know, we were seeing the How to Succeeds and the Tommies and the right, um, which had come from La Jolla. So we really did think that we would move. And when it didn't happen, it was, Harmony is my biggest um, uh, heart sore. Like it, like the, the most extraordinary moments of my career were with Harmony and the biggest heartbreaks. Yeah, of course. Yeah, with the highs are highs, the lows are lows. I mean, yeah. I feel like they're they're somehow uh, inextricably linked. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I worked on the show for I think sixteen years o over the course of sixteen because we did the show in La Jolla, then we did a reading, then we did another workshop, then yeah. we did a, like a what would now be considered a lab, intermittently performing with Barry at Madison Square Garden and in Vegas and stuff to try to keep the the yeah. momentum of the show going on. And by the time it finally got another production at uh, <clears throat> in LA, a co-production between LA and, and Atlanta, I had just aged out. I was the only one left from the original production. Uh, uh, and by that point I was 106. And correct, but you looked great. <laughs> they were like, you just, just a couple of years too old, 104, we would have, we could have aged oh, they called And they were like, we would love for you to come in and audition for you know this role. And I was like, I, 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 I feel, Oh, I think I like, and you walk, and you, you were like, "Is this wheelchair permanent?" You were like, "It yeah. is. It is. Yeah. Uh, I'm ancient." Um, but you look great. Uh, okay, so then Lion King. Um, it's what's your first introduction to the show? Luke has a question about um, you and Lion King, which I'll ask in a moment. But talk yeah. to us about where your first exposure uh, or first uh, kind of entrance into this huge chapter of your life <laughs> start. Remarkable. I, I, I'd seen it. Uh, I joined the show five years in, so okay. I, I had seen not the original, but many of the the originals. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, we as actors, we watch shows and we look for where we fit in, right? <laughs> and I was like, this is the best thing I've ever seen. I can't do it, but wow! And that was a new experience for me to enjoy something so much that I really didn't believe myself to have any, you know, future with was kind of generous for me. <laughs> I was like, this is awesome. I'll never be in it. And um, congratulations to all of you who are perfect for this show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I auditioned for the LA company and got down to the wire and, and didn't book it and got some feedback from Julie that was useful. Um, and at that point you're going in for Scar, Timon, Pumbaa. What are you going in for? You don't know. You're just Ed. going in. Ed, the hyena. Ed. Okay, yeah. great. So, so to play Ed and Ed typically covers Timon and uh, Timon and Zazu. So also those sides were what I was prepping. Uh, but the focus was on Ed. And so a year or so later, um, they they called again and asked if I would go to L.A. And I, I wasn't willing to because they were um, they were using L.A. as a point of origin. So I would have to pay, you know, my rent in New Jersey and L.A. And it just I, I don't know what. I was thinking, but I was like, no, let me know when something opens up in New York. <laughs> and it that ended up happening. And I went in again for another work session with Julie, knowing what she had said the previous time so I could work on it. And uh, this time around, they added the scar stuff. And I think just because I'm, I was the right size to sort of do all of those. Yeah. And I had covered so many men in mattress that the idea of covering four guys, uh, felt doable. Yeah. Um, so the the planets aligned and I, I played Ed for a year, actually 11 months. I, I left a month early to do one of the workshops of Harmony. And uh, then- and This was the Broadway company at the new Amsterdam. That's right. Okay. Uh, and then they didn't they didn't renew my contract after my first year. And you we find out at Lion King months and months and months in advance. You're in like month six or seven when you find out if you're getting renewed for another year. So I, I finished up knowing that I wasn't coming back. 
And um, what are your feelings about that? Did you uh, that say you didn't feel like it was a fit? You felt like uh, this is mutual. F you guys. I want to keep going. Where, where did where what happened? No, I you know I didn't really know what happened. I just knew that it wasn't that that I wasn't for whatever reason what they were looking for. And in hindsight, I couldn't have done more than another year as Ed anyway. Um, Enrique Segura took over for me and has been doing it ever since. And that whole trio, him, Benita Hamilton, and Jay, um, James Brown Orleans, Jabo, uh, are like, they're magical. And mm -hmm. they have kept them as the Broadway trio because they are magical. Yeah. And, and I wasn't that. I was a good understudy. I wasn't the best Ed. Okay. Uh, so when they called again, I guess I was off for, I'd done the harmony reading or workshop and then went off and directed a show at CCM in Cincinnati. And then they, they called and said, would you wanna to go to the tour? Uh, while well, this guy is learning the understudy tracks, as he's learning them, you'll be there to cover them. So you'll cover less and less as he learns more and more. So yeah, that sounds fun. And it turned out to be a, a guy that I knew very peripherally from waiting in line on auditions. Like we would just always be online together and he had, I'd seen him maybe a month earlier and he's like, hey, do you have any advice on Lion King? They're bringing me in for Timon. And so we talked about that. And I get to the first, my first stop on tour, which was Indianapolis. And it turns out that the guy who was learning the roles was this guy, Jim Ferris, who has since become, you know, my, one of my dearest friends. You know, I, I married he and his wife. So, uh, oh, wow. yeah, the Lion King has like just changed my life. Yeah. In, in you know, regards to my career, my personal life, look, it just, it helps yeah. reshape who I am. Yeah. Wow. And so then you just start, th then it's just a constant renewal of contracts, moving you to this company, moving you to that company. He's good here, but he's good here. Let's put him here. We can go here. And then 15 years later, you've done what? Every production of the show, you've played every part that you physically could play in the show. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So Great. yeah. I played uh, Ed, Scar, Zazu, Timon, and Pumbo. One, two, three, four, five. Yes. Um, and I guess I'd done the show. By the time I left, I'd done the show on Broadway, both national tours, resident directed one of the national tours, um, and uh, China. I helped to, I was the kids director in the China, the Shanghai. Yeah. Great. Um, Luke has one question and then I'm going to, I have, uh, I have a question for you. So Luke says, Tom Christopher Warren, what was it like to play Scar in the uh, Lion King musical? And what was your favorite moment playing him? Oh, Luke knows perfectly well how much I love playing Scar. I got to meet Luke and his mom in the lobby, uh, between shows one day I was in my Scar makeup, uh, keeping my makeup on between shows Yeah. and he and his mom were getting a tour of the theater by one of the house managers. And uh, Luke and I struck up a conversation. I can't even remember how old he was at the time, maybe 15. And it, he was, he's just a remarkable human. His family is remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the very sad part of this story is they moved out of Columbus when I moved to Columbus. Oh, no. <laughs> a moment where we crossed paths uh, and they had us over for dinner. Um, but yeah, what was it like to play Scar? I loved every second of it. He's, yeah. of, you know, I always get, who's your favorite to play Scar? Because sure. the band is always fun. Um, yeah, I had an absolute blast. Was there like ever, you're the bad guy, it's a kid's musical. Is there ever like you come off for bows and people boo? For sure. Oh God, I could imagine. Like, For oh, her. Was, I guess that's a testament to like, you're killing it. Yeah, literally. And okay. the ones who consistently got booze because they're, they were so brilliant. You know, Patrick Page was like yeah. the darkest, just yeah. um, Derek Smith. Like these are actors of like profound complexity and depth. And, okay. you know, I, I would just aspire to, to their, Come on. I would enjoy your booze. I would. You have your own depth. We love you, Tom. You're full of, you're full of depth. Um, Caitlin says, why did they let you know so early about contract renewals? That's so awkward, but maybe helpful for planning your next adventure. Is it? I, I never really thought about that. The awkwardness of how we're not going to renew you, but you still have <laughs> four months left. Have a great show tonight. Is, yeah. it, is it weird and strange or no? Yes. Just for the world. Yeah. No, it's very strange. It does help us to plan ahead. You, you have to go through the stages of grief with it, right? And you're just going through it while doing your job eight times a week. <laughs> Great. Odd. But it literally takes them that long to recast, build the clothes. You know, everything is handcrafted. Um, and it the, the shops all work together and independently both. And so to get a track built for 
you know, for me, if I was covering three roles at the time, that's that's a lot of tens of thousands of dollars worth of costume yeah. that has to be built. Uh, the tracks have to be learned. So they have to hold auditions. It, just, it takes a while. Crazy. And yeah. what was it? Uh, you know, is it at this point, it's got to be a machine because they put so many people into it. So what is it like going from mattress where you're replacing mid contract, but, but it's still new and most of the original cast is there. And then what is it like to go in Lion King where it is just this mammoth, mammoth show with so many moving pieces that it has to run like a machine in order to run as long as it's run. It does. It does. You know, Mattress was interesting because it got bad reviews and a bunch of folks jumped ship quickly. So wow. Victor Victoria was running and a lot of people had come from Victor Victoria and went right back into it when wow. they sort of figured the show wasn't going to run. <clears throat> um, and I wasn't there for the rehearsal process. I wasn't, there was a lot of um, the, the rehearsal process for that show was apparently really hard okay. and I wasn't there for it. I didn't experience it. I was also making my Broadway debut. So no one could tell me anything <laughs> bad. Like, yeah. I, I was like, this is the best thing ever. Yeah. Sorry, you all had a crappy experience, but I'm having a blast. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I, I, you literally couldn't tell me anything negative about the show, but it, it was hard for some folks. And we came to work every day thinking it was going to close that week. We we really did for six months look for the closing notice on a weekly basis. And that living with that kind of um, anxiety was was new for me. But again, I was like, I'm taking advantage of every, literally every second. Um, as a swing, there was a six week period where um, Bob Walton booked, uh, who's in our ensemble, booked something somewhere. So I stepped in for him for six weeks. So I, I got to feel right. ownership of that ensemble track, right? Um, and like, look at that, you know, that cast list was Mary Lou Rosado, Jane Krakowski, Luke Leal, David Aaron Baker, Heath Lambert, like Ever. one theater luminary after another, like remarkable actors who sang really, really well too. Yeah. But like, you know, Mary Lou Rosado, I could watch her read the phone book. Yeah. Um, it, just breathtaking. And uh, so that's what I got out of it. And then Lion King was, okay, you're going to learn all of this information. This is how this show functions. Mm -hmm. This is how this show functions in this theater. This is how this show functions on tour. This is how this show functions at the Minskoff. And it's all very similar and different. Right. You know? Yeah. And it, the, the makeup and all of this mm -hmm. is uh, you had someone who, you know, because of course most shows like Cats, people think there's someone who comes and does your makeup, but you do your own. Yeah. Uh, of course, Alphaba has hers, right? And Phantom has his. Scar, Lion King, there's someone who does your makeup for all the tracks or no? Yeah, so the hyenas do their own makeup. Okay. Um, when when I joined the show, Derek Smith was our Scar. He was doing his own makeup because he knew how to do it. He's the only Scar. No one has done their own since. Scar has a time appointment in the makeup chair. Um, Simba, Nala, the kids, Pumba, Timon, Zazu, uh, they're all done by the the makeup team yeah and new york has three makeup chairs so you get your appointment time and you show up and you get your hair did and your makeup done and off you go and they're they're painting throughout the first act you know they'll front load with the the folks who are in act one but grown simba and nala aren't on till act two sure. so well they get theirs done during act one wow yeah. yeah. Oh, and it would have to be a well-oiled machine with this many moving pieces. Caitlin, uh, hashtag Team Scar. She says she has so many Scar questions. She said, "How cool is the headdress? What was your favorite Scar scene besides all of them? Uh, and can you talk about the wild stage? The wild stage. I don't know yeah. what that means. Do you know I'm what that not means? either? But I'll the 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 headpiece, the mask was incredibly cool. Okay. You know, all of the masks and puppets require a little bit of um, you have to learn the dexterity." For some reason, Scar came very naturally to me. It, it has a finger control with a, a motorized, you've got a battery on one hip and a motor on the other hip, and you've got, now it's Bluetooth, but back when I was in it, not so much. Um, you've got these cables running up your arm and up your back, and so it makes the, the, the stick, the boom that the mask sticks on, <clears throat> go up and down, and then the mask itself can do this on the boom, so you've got two controls. Wow. Make it work. And for some reason that came very naturally to me. So I, I really loved working with the mask and we did a lot of mask work yeah. in work sessions with uh, whoever the resident director was at the time right. or with Julie when she would come back and visit. Um, 
Crazy. My favorite moment of Scar was I loved the flying. I loved, loved that foy harness. Yeah. I loved the harness, but I loved the flight. <laughs> so they would use me to train whoever the guys were on the on the fly system because they knew that I wouldn't, not only would I not complain about being called, I was like, wee! Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. yeah, and it, most people don't like that. So that's, uh, I flew in a production of Wizard of Oz years ago and it was not my favorite thing in the world. I, I, I completely, in someone else's hands and in utter lack of control of my body, I'm like, I don't know that I, um, so she's followed up uh, with uh, the stage is wild. I, I thought there was like, there's because Caitlin, you put like little asterisks around wild. So I thought maybe there's some inside joke that I don't know, but I get it now. You're, you're hilarious. We like you. Here you are. <laughs> she's saying like, how does pride work? The will to be seen jungle scene. Is it, is the stage raked? I mean, is it, was it crazy? And then because we're here because of the Minskoff, happy birthday, Minskoff, yeah. did it change between the New Amsterdam and the Minskoff because you were involved with both iterations? Much more of a change from Broadway to tour. Okay. Uh, obviously, you're not, <clears throat> you, they're no longer touring with a with that kind of a rake. Um, it is pretty heavily raked in New York. Yeah. Um, and it's painted in this weird, wonderful, sort of hashtaggy, gritty kind of graphic. <laughs> Uh, so what was tricky for me was just knowing there's there's no way to spike yourself because right. of how the stage is painted. And when I went back into, I went back to the Broadway company two years ago for uh, to cover a medical leave for a couple of months, and they had on top of all of this crosshatch graphic, they'd splattered, they'd added a splatter to the stage, and I was like, I have absolutely no idea where I am, none at all, none. They're like Tom. Uh, that's downstage, and you yeah. just go back to the audience. Great, yeah. 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 nailed it. Really crazy. Uh, the um, on tour, the Pride Rock thing that comes out is it, it comes out on tour. How does that? I mean, so like, on tour, it telescopes into it. Like in New York, obviously the stage is hollowed out, so it can spiral up. Right. Uh, on tour, we can't do that, so it telescopes into itself uh, in the wings and has a little like like literally like a gaming joystick off stage and it like a train on a train track it just untelescopes and then goes around a track wow that's incredible yeah oh the to wrap your mind around all of this um uh okay this is what tom says we have so many lion king questions i love this sometimes we have no questions but today they have all the questions I love that. Tom, we love tom he says i have had uh, uh i have heard that all new cast members of lion king are required to operate the draft just to learn how difficult it is and that if the person playing the draft is coming towards you get out of their way can you confirm or deny that is uh not true um, <laughs> the giraffe is probably the one a uh, puppet that I have. Well, no, I've never been in the cheetah or the rhino, but um, no, you only get on those giraffe stilts if you Absolutely. either understudy it or play it. And it takes them a good solid month to get comfortable up on those stilts. It's it's tricky. Um, and yes, I would say that if someone were coming towards me, I would get the hell right out of the way. <laughs> Correct. They're, they're dealing with more than I am on my feet. <laughs> Correct. Uh, move uh, and they move. take them space um I, I years ago uh a couple of years ago i was getting a tour of um hudson scenery because it's all i ever wanted um yeah. i was like show me where all the sets are built and when i walked in they opened the door and it's you know it's just a big it's a domino sugar factory on the river and then this warehouse and you open the door and it was the sun from lion king and i was like what and they said oh yeah they're made of like tissue paper and rods and they break all the time. So we make about three suns every year. Um, it, it, crazy. I mean, is, are they going through these things? Like, you know, yes, I mean, they take a lot of wear and tear. Not every, you know, you don't build things to last for 20 years. Right? Yeah. True, true. You build them to last for a couple. And then you, you sort of see how the wear and tear, uh, you know, takes its toll. But the, the whole design of the show is based on Julie's idea that it should look, like you could create these things at home. A child could could make a sun out of silk and string. Like you fold a paper fan up and you just unfold it, right? That's all the sun is. You know, it's a zillion dollars worth of silk and string, but it's that's the 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 structure of it, the sort of um, root components of these design elements are simple. Um, you know, the gazelle wheel. We use that as a as an example. That bicycle looking thing that the yeah. Actress pushes and these gazelles resolve, revolve. Um, it, it's she shows you the mechanics of everything. Yeah. Deliberately, you are meant to see the wheels and the gears and the spokes because she wants you to believe that you can create this kind of magic 
in your living room if yeah. you're 10 years old. You can be Simba or not. And I, I, that's the part that I think moves me the most of the visual of the show. That's beautiful. So then speaking of, uh, you know, reactions and audience and kids and all of this, the first time I met you was during one of these cub camps um, where you were running the cub camp. And I was, I don't know why, who hired me. Um, I don't, I don't remember. Did. Uh, but me, uh, me and a girl named Tess, I think was her name. Yeah. God, this is a long time ago. We were brought in to be essentially child wranglers because they're like, you're good with kids, be the child wranglers. And I remember watching you work with these kids and I thought this guy's probably an incredible director. So then now knowing that you've had this experience, you know, uh, with these cub camps of, of essentially prepping a whole bunch of kids for the audition process because you go through these kids like water at the puberty moment. And then knowing that you were also the resident director of Lion King at certain points, was this always in the back of your mind? You were always good at that. It was something you wanted to do. It was something you just fell into. And then how does that transition into the professorial version of your life that is now? Yeah, I don't know if I've always been good at it. I, I've always been interested in it. I've always had opinions. So <laughs> when you have opinions and a big mouth, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? And you're watching, like, you know, when, you, when you're constantly soaking up information and learning through watching, it does kind of lend itself to being a good teacher or director, I think. Right. Um, so I was speaking my opinions early enough to sort of go, maybe I could actually apply these opinions to creating something. And it started with thinking, oh, I'd be a great show doctor. I, I'll let somebody else do all the heavy lifting and then I'll come in and be like, no, 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 no. But think of it like this. Yeah. And it took me a while to actually look at myself as a, as a director. Uh, and I got there, which is nice. But it's also what made me, a, I think, an effective resident director because I wasn't directing. I was taking Julie Tamor's vision and keeping the integrity of it, right? right. Um, but using the same language and vocabulary as a director with while teaching the show to brand new people, while maintaining the show with folks who had been in it for a while, um, finding the vocabulary that works for each actor. You know, one actor takes notes a certain way. Another actor needs notes in an entirely different way. Working with adults and kids. Um, right doing the China company where we had six kids, <clears throat> one of whom spoke English, um, better than me, <laughs> better than I. Uh, she, Rita is her name. And she was, she was I think, she was either Korean or she went to school in Korea, um, but her English was legitimately better than mine. Wow. Um, and she actually was at 11, uh, I, I don't know who's going to see this, but a little better than my interpreter at being able to really. Or here, your interpreter has just commented she hates you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Love you. Um, Could you imagine? And she's here. Come on in, Tom. It's over. Um, uh, what? Is, so then talk to me because it's such a tricky thing, I think, to be in the acting shoes and in a position of authority. For me, I've been a dance captain a couple of times and it's, you're navigating this precarious thing. I'm working alongside you and then I'm giving you notes. So becoming going waffling back and forth between being in the show, being a resident director, then being back in the show. Was it tricky to then be playing Scar and knowing that like, oh, that guy's a mess, but I can't give him any notes because I'm not the resident director anymore? Or it's you or you can just put on the mask, put on your hat, and then away you go. I'm I'm pretty adept at adept at taking one hat off completely okay. and putting on the other hat. Not everyone wants to do that. I, I have no issues with stepping out of a performer role completely um, and looking through the other lens. And I was lucky enough that for the most part, everyone that I worked with as a resident director, all of the actors with whom that I worked um, didn't take notes personally, didn't look at it like, oh, this is, you're giving me a note because that's how you did it. Right. It really wasn't that. I, I By that point, I had seen so many versions of every role. There was no one definitive way to do it. Nice. And John Stefanik was the associate at the time, still is, <clears throat> and is amazing at allowing people to bring their own magic to, to the roles. So no, I would have been a, a it would have been a real um, dick move to go in and, and say, do it like this because right. there is no this. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. And especially I see, I wouldn't think that would be the case with the show that's well oiled and long running. And it, it, but, but I think that's probably why it still does well because there is, there is uh, some actor, 
decisions and choices to be made within the whole of it all. Okay. So then you, um, how many years is it that you've been, you moved down to New York city to Columbus. You've been teaching at Otterbein, Otterbein for, how, uh, for how long? I'm in my fourth academic year. So I started in the fall of 2017. Oh my God. It's been four years, which is crazy. Isn't that crazy? Uh, We're my bar, bar, last semester of my fourth year. Crazy. And is it uh, teaching? What are you teaching specifically? Um, do you like this part? Do you like teaching? What is it like teaching in a global pandemic? Tell me all the things. I, I don't love teaching in a global pandemic. I don't think anyone loves teaching or learning in a global pandemic. But the weirdness is we're doing it. Kids are learning. We're teaching. We're figuring out ways. You know, we, the, the spring musical this year was my directorial assignment, and we filmed it much like a movie. And so the students both performance students, the tech design students, the stage management students learned out of necessity an entirely new skill set in uh, in theatrical storytelling, but also cinematic storytelling and kind of living in both worlds. Yeah. So that part has been great. Um, the safety protocols for singing are, you know, are really hard. They're really, really stringent. And we're going above and beyond the uh, CDC and the federal and the local and university protocol. We're going further, um, which is awesome for safety, less awesome for doing what we do the way we know how to do it. Right. Um, but that being said, I love teaching. I love Columbus. Um, I love our kids. You know, they're, and they're not kids, but you know what I mean? Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, Ava Arkin, is she there? Yeah, she is. She's a junior yeah. this year. Her class, she's so, I mean, again, comes by it honestly, right? Because of her parents, her mother is an extraordinary dancer uh, and on faculty at Juilliard. And um, so Ava's class right now, the junior MT studio class in this semester, they are devising their own theatrical pieces. They're taking a narrative and expanding on it and devising it. We sort of used the woodsman and James Ortiz's um, just genius. And he came and talked, came virtually came and talked with us about yeah. what it is to devise pieces. So we're sort of using that as a, a jumping off point. Uh, Ava's group is working on a, a, a story based on where the sidewalk ends. Uh, yeah, come on. Yeah. Yeah. And they're both, they're divided into two groups and they're both just killing the game. So. Wow. Yeah. Ava, um, uh, we, when she uh, booked Otterbein, I guess we call that when she booked sure. college, booked sure. it. Um, she, uh, I think uh, now I can't remember. I don't know. She, she was uh, working at, at the yeah, she, yeah, she was working at my gift shop. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, have, I had met her mom and she had come on our tours and all of the things. Um, yeah, I love when all my worlds collide in all the different places of the world. Um, and it connected me to PPAS. That's why I went to PPAS last year when we could do such things and worked with uh, those students, which was remarkable. Yeah, it's a it's a that program is also pretty uh, a pretty special thing that happens in in those four brick walls. Um, do you did you feel transitioning into being a professor teaching was it a natural segue? Did you what, did you feel like oh I'm I'm making a hard left turn? I would love to keep performing, but maybe this is of the moment. Uh, what is that? What is that feeling like having to change? Because so many people were forced artists to change mm -hmm. uh, your path this year. What was it like to do that of your own volition pre-pandemic? Mine wasn't really a band-aid pull. It was more gradual. I had directed at CCM uh, while I was in Lion King. I took a little leave of absence and went and did that. And then I started teaching at the New York Film Academy while I was in Lion King. So I was doing double duty teaching, uh, though not full-time academia, but still lots of teaching. Um, and so by the time it came to shift gears and, and it was more of a decision to leave New York, honestly, than it was a decision to leave performing for teaching. Okay. I knew that I, I had had enough of this, I, I don't know, I felt that there was a lack of empathy in New York that was starting to take a toll on me. I was starting to be angry in ways that I'm just not typically. Uh, and I was interviewing, we were in the middle of the last administration. Well, no, we weren't. I I had my interview on the night of the night after the election. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> hopes were high, spirits were high. Spirits were so high. <laughs> All the optimism. Yeah. So I was definitely ready to have a slower pace yeah. um, in my living situation, not so much work situation. I, I, I went from a relatively low stress work environment to a really relatively high stress work environment and a relatively low stress 
high stress life in commuting, you know, yeah. to, I live in Columbus, everything's 20 minutes from everything. It's a fabulous city. Uh, it's a great food city. It's a great queer city. It's a great music city. Yeah. And it's a great theater city. So I haven't, I've actually worked on more equity contracts since I left Lion King than I had worked on in 15 years. So, and, and I've been lucky enough to have two contracts during the pandemic um, that were, you know, equity remote streaming. Right. And this local, um, uh, this theater that's there that's doing incredible things is Short North Stage. Is that right? Yeah, they're amazing. They're amazing. And they're not the only equity house in town. Um, and they're not the only theater in town. Like there's a, a really sort of vibrant theater scene here. We right. don't have a, what we don't have is like a Cleveland Playhouse or a Cincinnati Playhouse in the park. Short North is this extraordinary, like up and coming, hungry. It's run by folks who uh, you know, were New Yorkers and who did exactly what I did. They, they decided to move back to uh, Central America-ish. And, um, but they all have that frame of reference for having worked, you know, done tours and done Broadway and done, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and I love it. It's a, it's a hundred year old building that's falling apart um, and feels very much to me like every off-Broadway theater other than New York. <laughs> Correct. So like you're in there, it was an old burlesque house, it was an old blue movie theater. It's just one of those crumbling old buildings that needs some love. And the folks who run that theater and who come in and perform there are there because they friggin' love it. They yeah. love each other, they love the craft, they love this falling down building, they love that there's one, well, maybe nobody loves that there's one toilet, um, but- You make do. You make do, you make do, uh, yeah. Wow, incredible. Um, we, you're, I could talk to you for all the days. Um, uh, if we want to follow you in the world of social media, what is the best way to follow you? Well, probably Instagram or Facebook. I'm on Twitter, but I never do anything. Um, okay. We'll do Instagram, TC Dub. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your website is Tom T H O M Christopher Warren.com. Is that right? It is. I hope that I've done that right. Great. And then tell us about you have an upcoming student show that you and tell me all the things. Yeah. So Into a Lamplit Room was devised by Aubrey Berg and Julie Spangler for CCM back in 2013. And I was lucky and I was directing there at the time. So I saw it. Okay. And it was this little black box 10 person. Um, song cycle that Aubrey devised and Julie did the arrangements and they're stunning. And it's sort of been in my head for, you know, eight years. Uh, and when it came time for us to find something that we could license for remote streaming, that list is really short from the licensing houses. Sure. So I approached Aubrey and I said, can we do this? He said, yeah, I've got to talk to the Vile Estate. And the Kurt Vile Foundation was like, yeah, absolutely. You got to talk to Aubrey. It's like, great. <laughs> Everybody says we can do this. Great. And so we decided to film a bunch of it in black and white on location and a bunch of it in color on our set contemporarily and sort of juxtaposed between the two constantly going between period and contemporary to sort of show how relevant the Kurt Vile catalog still is. Yeah. And it's, I partnered with, um, I don't know if you know, Blaine Alden Krauss, uh, okay. Broadway guy um, <clears throat> in the original production and is a dear friend. And there's a song cry to beloved country from lost in the stars that, when I really started thinking I want to do this show was last summer in the middle of um, the conversations that we were having following the murders of George Floyd and uh, Breonna Taylor. And this song I knew needed a, a lens that was not mine. So Blaine came in and he storyboarded that for me and directed that shoot. Uh, and it's great. great. Yeah, it's really, it's really going to be gorgeous. The kids all did extraordinary work. The designers all did extraordinary work. It's beautiful. Wow. Um, in the chat, for those who are following along in the comments, I dropped the link to um, to how to get tickets at outerbind.edu with a whole bunch of things. So click on that if you want to get tickets to support because you should. And then uh, the comment below it, I put what uh, moments it's streaming, dates and times, so that all that information okay. is there. Um, and so I, to follow up, Chrissy um, McNair had said, over the last year, my heart has been with those who make their living in the theater. How do you think people are coping as fans? How, what can we do to support them? I, th in a lot of ways, this is, um, Chrissy, I would say this is a great easy way to support, uh, is the future of these people who are going through programs right now where the outlook of the industry looks pretty dire because there is no industry that they're being funneled into after paying all this money to go to school. So I think um, in anything, it's uh, the best way you can always support is to support when they're young uh, and they're just starting out and figuring it out. And inherently you're supporting people like Tom, I think, and these institutions that are just trying to make it work and and do the best they can and going above and beyond in this moment um, that is insanity. And so you should all go buy tickets and you should do that because we're going to be doing that. Um, and, and, well, I mean, we're coming back. 
we oh, really yeah I, I, the there was that article i don't know six seven months ago that you know new york is dead like, no it's not it, you know will it be the same fiscal hub of the universe that it was maybe maybe not it, it'll look different but yeah the arts aren't going anywhere from new york city no no, it's it, it, if we've made it this far, uh, we're going to be fine, uh, yeah. both in the pandemic and just life far in life in yeah. general. Yeah, it's uh, I have all the hope in the world. Um, and yeah, it'll it's just it's going to take time. But the weather's turning. You can feel hopes on the horizon. You feel like uh, machinations and, and and plans are starting to be put forth of uh, of what the what it looks like now that more people are vaccinated and things like that. So when we started this series 41 weeks ago or 39 weeks ago, um, you know, we're in a very different place, uh, you know, all these, all these, uh, weeks and months later. Yeah. And we didn't know anything either. Just, just come out the, if you want to call it the other side, but having a little bit of hindsight is helping us to wrap our, many of us to help our, uh, you know, help us wrap our heads around what the future with this living peripherally around us could look like and how we can still thrive. Yeah, for sure. Um, your dream. Um, yeah. These people are, uh, these students are so lucky to have you. We're so lucky to have you for an hour and uh, two minutes of our lives. So thank you. Um, thank you truly from the bottom of my heart. It's so good to see you even if it's virtually. Um, I love you. Congratulations on everything. Uh, you both your career, your performance, yeah, everything, everything about you. Um, and uh, we're one day closer to Broadway um, and you're a dream and uh, good luck with the production. We'll all go watch and give you all our money uh, and, um, and happy Saturday and we'll see you soon. Tom. Love you. Love you. Bye. Bye. Just um, the moment I met him, you know, I, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you a hilarious story. I met Tom Warren and I was so new to the business and I didn't know anything. And I was talking to a friend and they said, oh, I went to CCM. And I said, oh, I met a guy I think who's directed there. Um, I think his name's Tom Schumacher. And um, <laughs> and the guy from the school said, it's not Tom Schumacher. That's the guy who runs all of Disney theatricals. Um, it was probably Tom Warren. And I was like, you're absolutely right. That was absolutely. Now I laugh because I'm like, the, they're very different humans. Um, and uh, but what do I know? I was just a child. And here I am still a child that knows slightly more. Here we are. Um, he is a joy. Uh, you know, he, for a, a period of time when he was, uh, Tom was teaching at NYFA, New York Film Academy, yeah, he brought some students on the tour and that's when we reconnected. And uh, he said, you love this and you're, you really enjoy this and I want to do this. Are you hiring? And I said, uh, aren't you in Lion King? You're making all the money in the world. And he said, no, it's not about the money. It's the, it's the craft and the, the exploration of the history and, and the pr preservation of, uh, of this incredible art form that we all want to be a part of. And so, um, and so I hired him. He was on my green team for uh, for a minute, but I would always laugh. He'd be like, I'm on for a Pumbaa today or on for whatever. And he'd be taking off his green Broadway Up Close shirt and going to put on a um, warthog makeup. And I, <laughs> that transition um, <laughs> in a matter of minutes after a tour always made me laugh. You're like, this is why we do this. We, when we're not on the stage, we're on a sidewalk and telling these weird stories, whether it's in Pumbaa warthog makeup or in a green shirt. So here we are. Um, if you followed us along this week, um, uh, I received a 1917 brick in the mail. Uh, just a couple of days ago, and the, the joy that I um, that <laughs> that I listed in my kitchen when I got this brick um, it made me the happiest human ever. I connected with an actor named John Long, and we were talking about this massacre of these five theaters uh, demolished in 1982 to build the Marriott Marquis Hotel just one block north of the Minskoff, and. Um, he said, I took a brick as a souvenir. It's traveled with me for 39 years. Um, you are obsessed and you love this. I'm going to mail you this brick. You'll like it more than I will. And so I got this brick. It's a Herbert J. Kraft brick uh, from his Morosco Theater in 1917. And so I'm working on, we're building a little display for it. So it'll be in a little box with some sort of little plaque uh, so that it can live at our gift shop uh, just steps from where it was first uh, instilled. Uh, because for 39 years, it hasn't been seen except uh, in his um, apartments uh, all over the country. Uh, and I said, I can't and just put it in my office. People got to see this. And so in addition to when we finish our paper crane project and that display is put up, we'll also have our little Morosco brick. Uh, so a little piece of Herbert J. Crap can live uh, in the middle of Times Square for you all to see. Um, you guys are awesome. I, I, I can't believe that we only have two weeks left, but uh, we're coming up on the final two weeks. Um, I'm moving into, if you've been following along of my insanity on social media, uh, we're moving into our office in Herald Square. 
And so all of that is slowly coming together. Uh, the last half of that is moving in and um, and new machinery and all kinds of things are coming. It's uh, <laughs> the theatrical insanity that I've orchestrated in the middle of this global pandemic is, well, it's all coming to a head uh, and it's, well, here we are. Uh, we don't know when the gift shop will reopen, but in the meantime, if you want to give me all of your money, um, you can do so uh, in our e-commerce store, which is um, uh, broadwayclose.com forward slash souvenirs. If you want 10% off, which, the uh, 10% off is Broadway 10. We'll get you 10% off there. And then as always, if you don't follow us on social media, specifically Instagram at Broadway Up Close, uh, this entire talk with Tom, uh, as well as all of our Minskoff videos this week will also be on our YouTube tomorrow. So uh, go to YouTube and hit subscribe and you'll get all of our notifications. We are officially one day closer to Broadway. Uh, you guys, uh, it means the world uh, from the bottom of my Broadway filled heart uh, that you spend a little hour uh, with us every Saturday as a way to keep Broadway alive until I can uh, rub elbows with you literally in the middle of Times Square. And so I look forward to that day. Hope is on the horizon. I think um, the the light of the end of the tunnel is, has been there for a couple of weeks, but uh, this week, uh, certainly it feels like it's grown a little more. Um, I love you all. Happy Saturday noon on Broadway. And I'll see you again Monday for week forty. Can you imagine? All right.